we always face the choice, am I going to stay dependent upon this substitute, if it's, if it's a people, a person, a program, a plan, if it's that, or am I going to find this kind of confidence in Jesus? And this is what uh, the Lord says in response to the, the bad shepherds that were abusing the flock. He said, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is about verse 9 of Ezekiel 34. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm against the shepherds, and I'm going to hold them accountable for my flock. There's accountability if you want to talk about it. I'll remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves, and I will rescue my flock from their mouths, and they no longer will be food for them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. And as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them on a day of clouds and darkness, and I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements of the land, and I will tend them in a good pasture. And the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in a good grazing land, and there they will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel." I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and strong I will destroy. And then back to about verse, uh, let me see here, about 27 or so. He says, and they will know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and rescue them from the hands of those who enslave them. And they will no longer be plundered by the nations, nor will wild animals devour them. They will live in safety and no one will make them afraid. And I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops, and they will no longer be victims of famine in the land or bear the scorn of the nations. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people. Why would we ever rob people from that shepherd? I mean, that's the only shepherd we would ever need. Bring that forward into the New Testament, where all of a sudden Jesus makes the statement. I mean, I never equated the two till we started talking about this passage, but when Jesus says, you know, I am the good shepherd. That is loaded as if that's this thing. He's saying, I'm here. You know, he's looking up upon humanity as, as, you know, sheep that are cast down, sheep without a shepherd, that without him, they can't get up. They're going to die in their condition. But the good shepherd's here. And you think about it, if we really saw this clearly, who of us with eyes open would knowingly and willingly choose a substitute? Absolutely. Absolutely wouldn't. But somehow that system mentality gives us a substitute. It gives us something to rely on other than him. Look at all that it says, I will find the scattered. I will bind them up. I will bring the brokenhearted. This is what he wants to do for everyone who's listening to us. This is, this is the life. And no, it just doesn't happen in a moment. You just don't sit down at a night and say, okay, I think I'm going to live this way now. <laughs> this, is, this is, as we've said over, this is a transition. It's a process. But this is a process worth getting through. No, it's not easy for many of us. Oh, not at all. Yes, it takes time. Yes, there are days you'll fe- feel angry, days you'll feel disoriented, days you'll feel abandoned. But that's just part of all him unraveling that religious way of thinking that will never bear the fruit of the kingdom. And if he can't unravel that, then we'll not get to live in this life. And for part of it, I think we have to stay through that process with him. As I said, there were times I think God was moving me that way, and I would get scared and run back to something more secure. And it's just his amazing patience that says, okay, we'll go back there and we'll start again. And I'll just keep inviting you back as far as you're willing to go before, you know, like little kids trying to go out in the dark from the house. Uh, we used to do this on my dad's farm, how far you could get away from the house before you freak out in fear and night and run back to the safety <laughs> of the light. I kind of see that in this. And yet God just keeps saying, no, I want you to invite, I want to invite you until you know that there is no more secure place on the planet for you to be than with me. That's what God's inviting us into. I don't think we really think through death, burial, and resurrection. The whole idea of resurrection life, that sounds so awesome, so fantastic, but I don't think we ever attach it. You know what? It never comes apart from the reality of, of, of death. Of the dying. And a burial. I mean, I, I've never heard anyone talk about the fun of a burial. We're just going like that. Especially when it's yours. It's like it's one thing to die. That's painful, but, you know, it's over. The challenging is that in between time, between when there is a death and I recognize it, and right before that resurrection life that comes, and you'll know it, 
But what do you do in that kind of buried time where you're just going like, man, this is disorienting. I don't know. I don't understand. That's what I, that's where that incubator of the kind of change that I think Jesus is wanting to bring in us. I think that's where it is. Yeah. And I think I want to willingly embrace it, knowing that you know what, I kn- I am persuaded. I know in whom I have trusted. What he began. He is going to finish. He authored it. He will finish it. And he's going to present me before him, you know, pure and blameless. I've never been pure and blameless, but that's what he's offering. And that's what he does so well. But it is a process. I had a brother call me this week, one of the faithful listeners to this podcast, and he called me to say, Wayne, how long were you angry through this whole thing? (laughs) And I said, why? He said, because I'm still angry. Every time I see the system raise its head, man, I want to speak out against that. And I want to, you know, the old Babylon thing. And I want to fight. It just had all this fight in him. He said, were you angry? And I said, oh, I was angry. How long? I said, ah, a few years, a couple of years. I don't know how long. How did you fix it? I, I don't know. <laughs> Someday when, when what was won over in me, I think, was this reality in Jesus is so real on its own yeah. that I don't want to have to fight that anymore. The, the problem is not that that exists. The problem is that people don't know Jesus real enough so that that isn't needed. And for me, that just took all the anger out of it. I'm not angry anymore. I mean, I I look at brothers and sisters captive in religious stuff, and I go, man, I love the day they'll be free from that. But I think looking back, even the places where I was betrayed and hurt by people, and uh, why, why am I not angry today? I think I'd have to say because I see now the fruit of that. What looked like a horrible thing when it happened sent me on a journey the fruit of which I wouldn't trade now for anything. I wouldn't trade how I live in him now for any other way that I used to live, any other safe-looking system. I mean, none of them look safe anymore. Nothing looks more safe to me than waking up this morning and living in him. I just want to leave us with one kind of image. It was was back when the Olympics were happening in this, this whole arena, and I remember a commercial watching one. It was a Coke commercial. And it was interesting. It it opened up with a bunch of people kind of in black and white tones. It was sort of young people sitting on the rooftops of houses. And they're just sitting there. They're isolated. They're separate. They're they're kind of alone. And they're not smiling. They're just waiting. And all of a sudden, there's, you know, a Coke can. I mean, it's goofy, but there's a Coke can. (laughs) Most of your stories have a little goofy element. But but, but, but that's that's part of my uniqueness. There's a Coke can that comes over, and and underneath the bottom, it just says the real thing. And all of a sudden, the sun shines, and everything turns golden. And then you see this other thing. It says, enjoy. And they give each other, you know, looks that said a thousand things. You're just going like, you know what? That is where I think humanity is poised. They're sitting on, on the outside of rooftops going like, I know this isn't it. Hmm. But I have an inbred hunger for the real thing. And when that emerges, man, everything turns golden and I get to enjoy. 